Well, this morning we're back in Acts chapter 23, and uh, after this week we'll be pulling away from Acts for a time, for the Advent season and into the new year, and David Notman's going to be preaching next week on the Beatitudes, and uh, as he comes to preach there, Julie and I are having the weekend off for our wedding anniversary, so... Uh, as David comes, remember him in your prayers as he prepares God's Word in this coming week. So let's turn to Acts chapter 23, God's mysterious ways, is what we're thinking about this morning. So from verse 11 in Acts of the Apostles. The next morning some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. And they went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We've taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin, petition the commanders to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about this case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. And the centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? And he said, Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They've taken an oath not to eat or drink until they've killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to the governor Felix. And he wrote a letter as follows. To his excellency, governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. <coughs> I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to the Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. And when I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. And the next day they let the cavalry go on with him while we returned to barracks. Then the cavalry arrived in Caesarea. They delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from and learning that he was from Cilicia. He said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. <coughs> then he ordered that Paul to be kept in guard in Herod's palace. <coughs> Amen. Praise God for his word. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, God's mysterious ways. And maybe they are mysterious ways because, you know, it's very often in our own lives we have circumstances that we can recall where we were faced with a circumstance and we had no idea what on earth we would do or how we were going to get out of it. What was going to happen? And then all of a sudden, some circumstance takes place and we see the hand of God. And it often comes from the most unforeseen place. We can work out all of the, the things in life. And we can make all the plans for life that we want to make. And yet, the reality is, unless God is in control. 
we mean nothing. It doesn't mean that we don't plan for the things in life. It doesn't mean that we don't prepare ourselves and do what we can do to make life as enjoyable as possible. But the reality is, unless the Lord is in control, then the fullness of life will never touch us. Even in preparing for this sermon this week, the reality of how God moves in mysterious ways brought back many, many memories. And no doubt, as we look at God's work this morning, the same will happen to each one of us here. God will, by His Spirit, lead us to think of certain situations that perhaps we've not thought about for a long, long time. Just to remind us once more that God fulfills His promises. And God fulfills his plans. At the beginning of this week there, I lost my voice. God has mysterious ways of doing things. And you know, sometimes when you think, how on earth can a preacher function if he loses his voice? It may be a blessing to the congregation, of course. It might make the sermon shorter, or it might make them longer, because it takes longer to speak. But the reality is, God moves in mysterious ways. And Paul's whole life as a Christian was one of total commitment to Jesus, even though his life was one of danger and trial. You know, sometimes we, we place Paul on this kind of pedestal up here, like, you know, he is some kind of super mega Christian. And he was a great servant of God. But he was no different from you or I when it comes to the circumstances of this life. <laughs> and in our passage, the trial and danger continues on, but... So does the faithfulness of God. And the faithfulness of God is alongside all the trials and the dangers. He's not exempt from the trials and the dangers, but God is with him in the trials and the dangers. We used to sing a, a chorus, you know, Jesus is the bridge over troubled waters and his banner over me is love. And it almost gives a picture, that chorus, of, of how you know, we're above all the trials and tribulations and all the difficulties and we're up here somewhere and we just sail over them. But it's, perhaps we should actually be saying Jesus is the way through the troubled waters and his banner over me is love. God moves in mysterious ways. And here we find in our passage Paul is yet in another life-threatening situation. He's coming once more before the Pharisees' angry hand of deception. And as the milieu of the religious leaders and the religious fanatics of the day come together, they start hatching a plot. There is nothing short of terrorism. And yet, God moves in mysterious ways. And once more, what supplies of these fanatics, these radicals, thwarts the plans of them by using non-believing heathen Romans. And God's got a real sense of humor when we consider that. The religious leaders of the day thought themselves so pious and so up here. We are great. We are beyond all contradiction. We are God's religious people. But they were not God's faithful people. You see, the religious leaders of the day had allowed themselves to become so angry 
that they moved into the realms of being fanatical about getting rid of Paul. And when leaders get fanatical, so do their followers. And there are many things in the walk of faith that we will never understand fully. And yet God moves in mysterious ways through them. Why would these people who were open to God's law wanted to fulfill the law in its essence? Why would they do such things? And the reality is that they open their lives to the twisting <coughs> and also the somersaults of theology to fit in with their own attitudes. You see, for Paul, his calling was never going to be an easy one. Pharisee of the Pharisee, absolutely mega, mega important. And yet he comes to Christ. And one of her own comes to faith, that's like a double slap in the face for the church leaders of the day. And these religious leaders move beyond God-given remit and God-given love. And they moved in the realms of the world and of the evil one. And they move beyond God's remit. And when you do that, you move into counterfeit faith and self-justification. And that's a dangerous place for anyone who professes faith in the one true God and his son Jesus Christ. In Jesus' day, the zealots who had a nominal trust in God were the radicalized terrorists of their day. <coughs> and uh, of course we know from Mark 15 and verse 5, the reality 15, sorry, the reality is that the murderer Bar Barabbas is actually chosen over and against the only perfect Son of God. One radicalized man had chosen to use violence and hatred to fulfill what he thought should happen to his nation. Jesus comes in the way of peace and joy and love. And he's the one that's killed. And what it reveals to us, and what this passage reveals to us, is there's nothing more dangerous than a terrorist to any nation's future. And we've seen this recently. And there's only one thing more dangerous than a terrorist, and that's a radicalized religious terrorist. A zealot, if you like. You see the stream and you see the connections. And you see the connections with our world today. During the time of Jesus, there were many radicalized zealots who reeled against Roman occupation. And as they used some radical, offbeat teaching of God's word, that's how they justified their actions. They honestly believed they were doing God's work. Religious, radical ideologies have not been confined to some of us who think it only applies to Islam. Jewish faith, Buddhist faith, Hindu faith, Islamic faith, and Christianity have all bred that most heinous of people, religiously radicalized individuals, whose atrocious crimes have left so many bereft of loved ones. And all justify their behavior in the name of God. In our passage, verse 12, some Jews form a conspiracy. In other words, those who were the fanatics wanted to gain favor and carry favor with the religious leaders. And they wind up each other. They feed off each other. And know the process. Conspiring their plan leads to murderous plans and oaths being made before God not to eat or drink until they kill Paul. Forty men in total. It doesn't take long to get folks on board with you. 
when you begin to move in extremism. And these radical Jews move from being followers of God to followers of the evil one. Here they justify themselves as doing something from God and something for God. And verse 11 reminds us of the brazen openness and the plan to kill Paul. They come to the chief priests and the elders. And the evil web of conspiracy continues even to the point where the assassins, in verse 15, well, they've worked out their ambush, ambush plans. And of course that was going to take place in the narrow streets of Jerusalem. And they want the leaders of the Jews, the religious leaders of the Jews, to pressure the Roman authorities to bring Paul there so that this can all take place. And so the radical followers <coughs> seek to draw in those who are in leadership over their faith. They want them to be drawn in as well. And so you have one big mess. You know, sometimes religious leaders collude. And when they collude with terrorism, it leads to horrendous consequences. And we've seen that in our world over these last few years. We're not told further about the reaction or comments of the chief priests or the leaders, but they were prepared to listen to the extremists. There was no written rebuke to them. There was no discipline extended to them, they were told, stop, this is unacceptable before God. They had their plans, and they were not averse to using violence to fulfill these plans. But it's interesting that Luke, in this passage of scripture, makes his focus not on the violence or the pending violence, but the Lord instead. The focus was to be on the Lord. And here in the accounts of the here are accounts of careful and cunning plans. And it goes on to say that human plans cannot succeed if God opposes them, according to Stott in his book on Acts of the Apostles. Remember Isaiah 54 and verse 17? No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is a vindication from me, declares the Lord. And God's mysterious ways are fulfilled, because it just so happens that Paul's sister's son is the one who is there on the ground. The sister or son is not mentioned by name, never mentioned again. Were they believers or were they not believers? Or did they just love a brother and an uncle? Whatever we think, they did have association with the leaders. They did have association with the temple. They could move around the area without raising any suspicion. God's mysterious ways fulfilled. People being in the right place at the right time open to be used by God to bring about his purposes. And as Luke reveals to us, this young man is a means by which God is going to bring forth his purposes. And throughout the history of time there have been individuals whom God has used to thwart evil plans of man. The evil plans of man. And God moves in mysterious ways. Remember the story of Esther? Esther 4 and 14, who knows but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. She was in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing to be able to save her people. And in our passage we see plans of sedition and wheeling and dealing, and God's messenger is Paul's nephew. He stood up for what was right. He fulfilled the purposes of God by going to the authorities. We need to remind ourselves that the Jews hated anything Roman. 
And yet, by God's mysterious ways, this youth goes to the hated Romans to fulfill God's plan. Who is the more holy? Who is the one closer to God? God's mysterious ways reveal in the life of a youth. And it's revealed in what would seem to be overkill. He sends a substantial proportion of the garrison to make sure that Paul's taken to safety by night. In those days, soldiers and armies did not move at night unless it was absolutely extreme, extreme, extreme. And here we find the hated Romans take seriously the threat and they move by night. 200 soldiers, 70 cavalrymen, 200 spearmen. And the commander was not going to lose this Roman citizen to a crowd of Jewish assassins. God's mysterious ways and provision revealed in the abundance of protection. As Barclay writes, Paul was a prisoner, but he was a Roman citizen, and therefore the commander mobilized a small army to see that Paul would get through to Caesarea, Caesarea to be tried by Felix. Such was the honour bestowed for a citizen. And it's strange how the fanatical hatred of the Jews, God's chosen people, contrasts with the impartial justice of the commander who was a heathen in Jewish eyes. A Gentile, someone not to have much dealings with unless you really, really had to or were forced to. God's sovereign, mysterious ways being fulfilled. And as Paul's taken by full escort out of the city to Caesarea, he's taken to that great city that was used as a Roman base. And one of the most fantastic harbours, it's maybe a wee bit difficult to see the picture here, but if you actually look on this particular area, that part there is actually the palace to where Paul was going to be taken to. You see the huge area here of harbour and then a sub harbour here for actually to have the supplies brought into the town and the city. The other area was actually under control of the military in a very specific way. So you had the naval side of things, you had the army side of things, the Roman authorities governed that place absolute precision. And such was the place that Paul was brought to. Herod the Great had built that palace in Caesarea and the Romans on occupation used this as their strategic port. 60 miles from Jerusalem to Caesarea and Antipatris was 25 miles from Caesarea. 30 miles, 35 miles of risk and hostility through the land, predominantly Jewish, predominantly rocky, and a bit dangerous for ambush. Hence why you had all the troops. And then once they were nearer Caesarea, the risk became less and less as the predominantly population was Gentile. So God's provision is perfect in every way. Paul, escorted with the army, reaches a safe haven, and the soldiers are sent back to barracks, and Paul is presented to the governor with a letter, sealed by the hand of Claudius Lysias, the commander in Jerusalem. And when read, Paul was kept in protective custody. Not at the Roman army barracks or the Roman naval base, but under the protectorate of the Roman palace guard, the specially selected palace guard. And this again was part of God's mysterious plan and provision. But it was no option of ease for Paul. Lest we think that Paul is coming here to be a special house guest in the lap of Roman luxury, Paul had to face Felix the governor 
Now this is a, a, a facial um, build up of how this man actually looked. It's amazing what they can do now with all the technology. But he was a man with a past. And he was a man who was to be utterly, totally feared. For five years, this man had governed Judea. Two years before that, he was stationed in Samaria. And as governor, he had two further years to govern in Caesarea and the surrounding area before being dismissed of the post. Such was the ways in which the Romans actually governed. Felix had begun a life as a slave. His brother was a favourite of the notorious Nero. The psychotic man who is supposedly playing the violin while Rome burns. And it was through his family connections that Felix rose to become a freeman. And then progressed through the ranks to become a governor. He was the first slave in Roman history to become a governor. And Tacitus, the Roman historian, wrote of Felix. He exercised the prerogatives of a king with the spirit of a slave. Felix even married a princess, the granddaughter of Antony and Cleopatra. Such was his influence. But on the other hand, he was totally, completely and utterly unscrupulous. He was more than capable of hiring thugs to murder his closest supporters. He did whatever it needed to be done to bring forth his purposes, even using extreme violence. And it was from God's mysterious ways of salvation from Jerusalem for Paul to be brought into the presence of one who was so feared by so many. It was like a, an out of the frying pan into the fire situation. But yet provision and deliverance on the one hand, the potential of trial and tribulation on the other. Who said that God's walk was easy? Who said that we are to demand a smooth and easy road, a perfect road? That's poor biblical teaching. And we know what poor biblical teaching leads to. It leads to radically wrong thinking and ultimately wrong actions. And as a Roman citizen on his arrival at the palace, Stott says that Paul was kept under guard, meaning he was not ill-treated as he had no criminal charges against him. And this is confirmed by Claudius Silas' letter. The Jews, God's people, persecuted Paul and the other believers with prejudice and violence. And yet, as we draw the passage to a close, we see the Romans, heathen authorities, maintaining rational standards of law, and they rescued Paul four times, till the courts could hear his case. Three times Paul was found innocent, and here you come in to the fourth time before Felix. And Paul had a sense of God's presence. And was absolutely confident that God was in control. There was no case to answer to the Romans. He's confident that the Jews had no case. As the faith that he had in Jesus was the faith of his fathers. And Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. And he would be with them whatever would come along. You know sometimes in the Christian faith the Lord rescues us from one situation only to lead us into an even more difficult situation. In the highways of the heart, Morrison declared, the reward of service is greater power to serve. And then he goes on to quote the Reverend W.G. Lowe's. And as he goes on to quote this man from the London Missionary Service, well, this man went out to New Guinea to serve on, a, on Savage Island. Very violent place it was at that time. And in some parts, still is. 
And Lois went out with his wife to serve the Lord. And they ministered the gospel in that situation. And it was long, hard, and dangerous work. They never knew from day to day whether they would live or die. But the Lord opened the door of salvation to a number of the folks they were witnessing to. And upwards, eventually, 1,000 converts came. They were in need of shepherds, so they trained up local folks to minister to their own islanders. They ministered to folk and raised them up to be able to translate the scriptures. And as God called them on to new pastures, he wrote at the time, I felt sorry to leave the work on Savage Island, but the call to harder work, more self-denying, is an honor from the master's hands. <clears throat> Do we want harder work? Do we want more persecution? God never said it was going to be easy. And God's mysterious ways are not the easy life. They are what they are. God's mysterious ways. God's ways. Not your ways, not my ways, not anyone else's ways, not this world's ways, not the government ways. God's ways. And within the mysterious leading and guiding of God, we find the faithfulness of God and the sovereignty of God and the preciousness of God there in our midst. Well, I wonder what God's mysterious way is for each one of us here this morning. 42 days to 2018. What does God have in store for us in the days ahead? Are we prepared to trust in God? <coughs> or are we prepared to go our own way? That's a challenge that God lays before us this morning. If we're prepared to walk with God, then He will walk with us. And his purposes will be fulfilled. And these may seem to be mysterious to us. But that's the walk of faith. Are we prepared to walk in faith with Jesus? Let's pray. Father, sometimes we read scriptures and we just gloss over them. I may never give it much more thought. And yet, Father, when we line up our lives in line with your work, we become challenged. Help us, Father, this morning to trust in you and to lean not to our own understanding. Help us to trust in your great and mysterious ways. And help us as we trust in you to be faithful in everything that we say and do to your glory and honour. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Mm -hmm.